Hello, my name is Mike Steer. I'm the Acting Research Director of Saudi Aquatic Sciences, which is the research arm of um, PERSA. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about the science uh, behind uh, the giant Australian cuttlefish. Now there's a place up in northern Spencer Gulf called Point Lowly around Wyala that has an extensive rocky reef. Uh, this reef plays host to um, an amazing spectacle. Uh, each winter, tens of thousands of giant Australian cuttlefish aggregate on this rocky reef to spawn. Uh, they are attracted to this reef because they, uh, they lay their eggs or they attach their eggs to the underside of that reef. This is a, um, an incredible natural phenomenon. It's the only place uh, we know of in the world where you get huge numbers of uh, cuttlefish aggregate on a particular site. And as such, it draws the attention of quite a number of uh, visitors, um, tourists, um, uh, documentary filmmakers, scientists, and it's along a stretch of coastline that also has a fair bit of um, coastal industrialisation. Over the years, uh, cuttlefish has been um, approaching iconic status in South Australia. And as I said, it's the only place in the world where you get this massive aggregation. And it's um, starting to achieve a, a, an iconic status up there with South Australia's Farmers Union iced coffee, uh, frog cakes and um, custard tarts. So in a really important population. Now, if we look at this, um, this uh, cuttlefish population through time and, and have a look at how it has developed, the first thing we need to consider is the commercial catches because uh, initially, uh, this species was um, and still is a, 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 um, permitted to be caught by commercial marine scale fish fishes. So you can see back in uh, the early 1980s um, through to the 90s, there wasn't much of the statewide catch. Um, this is catch landed in all of South Australia. You see it's around about five to 10 tonnes per year. But in the mid 90s, we saw this really big increase right up to about 250 tonnes in 1997. Now the reason why it increased so quickly is because the fishers um, found uh, the aggregation uh, in, in around Point Lowly and were able to catch quite a lot of cuttlefish in a relatively short time because these species uh, had aggregated. Uh, they were using cuttlefish at that stage for um, uh, as bait for snapper, so commercial fishers would come in uh, catch uh, a heap of cuttlefish and then use them for bait to then go and target snapper later on. Now clearly this was indicated um, as a bit of a concern because of you know fishing on a spawning aggregation. And in the following year, a, um, an exclusion zone was put in uh, in 1998, about halfway through uh, the spawning aggregation, um, which occurs around um, May, June and July, or it peaks in May, June and July. That exclusion zone uh, eventually covered most of that false bay area from the BHP jetty all the way across Point Benyth and jetty to the lighthouse. Around the same time, there was some work done by a PhD student here in South Australia that started to look at the cuttlefish abundance in that area. And she found that around, or in that year, approximately 100,000 uh, cuttlefish were aggregating on that uh, particular spawning area. <clears throat> now you can see once that closure was put in place, then the majority of the catch dropped out because most of this catch was coming from that false bay area. And you can see that that population, well that catch has rather dropped down to about uh, 10, 15, 20 tonne per year and has not really exceeded since then. Now the corresponding surveys of the cuttlefish abundance um, were relatively stable in those subsequent years straight after the imposition of that, um, that closure. Uh, you know, around about 150 plus thousand animals. So it seemed like that closure was really good in arresting um, you know, those commercial catches and maintaining that population through time. A couple of years went past and we were asked, or Sadi was asked to do another survey in 2005 by then the Department for Environment and Heritage because there was anecdotal information that that population had declined. Uh, we went out and did the survey and it had declined a little bit, uh, but it was still relatively high. Um, and you can see in the corresponding times that the statewide catch was relatively low as well. 
In 2008, 9 and 10, um, there was some work done uh, with BHP at the time using the same methodology that was described back in the early days here. Uh, so we know that all these data are comparable. And then we saw this precipitous decline um, down to a very, very low levels, around about 13,500 animals in 2013, which raised quite a lot of concern because of, that's a pretty considerable decline. As a consequence of that, um, a broader temporary fishing closure was put in place for Northern Spencer Gulf um, because that was the only thing at the time that was considered um, to be able, that, that the government could control. Um, uh, for us to at least have some time to work out what had caused that decline. And there was a fair amount of um, funding that was uh, given to uh, the state government and Saudi Aquatic Sciences to undertake some research to try and identify the cause of that decline. Since 2013, we've seen that the population has rebounded um, quite significantly, really identifying how quickly this fishery can respond. And in recent years, it's, it's although fluctuated on an interannual basis, it's been relatively stable. Okay, so there was three hypotheses that we wanted to look at uh, with regards to the decline from the peak of 1999 down to that real low level in 2013. Now, the, the biggest problem that we had is we had no information of the history of this, um, of this population. So there's one of three things um, that could have occurred through time. The first one is, well, perhaps the population has ma maintains a relatively high level of abundance through time. And what we've seen since that, uh, that peak in the late 90s or 2000s is a true decline um, of concern. The other alternative is that perhaps the population just bubbles along at a relatively low level. And then in the late 90s, we saw an ephem ephemeral population explosion. Um, and it now subsiding back to those baseline levels. And the third hypothesis is, well, maybe we've got this variation through time, these peaks and troughs in high and low levels of abundance, and we're just conforming to that natural population cycling. So we set out to work to try and identify what was driving this decline. So looking at that first scenario where we've got a, what we considered a, a, a real decline from a, 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 large, base, a large population assessment um, historically, there's a whole suite of things that we looked at. Uh, we tried to pull as much information as we could um, that was available to us, information around weather patterns, uh, rain, wind events, uh, coastal pollution, shipping traffic, shipping noise, and then a whole range of biotic um, effects as well, like the abundance of key predators like dolphins and seals, the impacts of trawling offshore, uh, the catches of cuttlefish uh, from the commercial and recreational fishery, the amount of divers on site undertaking tours and snorkeling investigations through that peak spawning area. The, the, the prey, or cuttlefish, tend to uh, predominantly feed upon crustaceans. So we looked at pats and prawns and crabs. The impacts of snapper, which is a, a key predator for um, cuttlefish as well. Uh, local aquaculture ventures, disease, um, changes in the environment, or um, other cephalopods in the area. So we did a whole suite of analyses, and all these analyses are in a report um, that can be freely accessed by the public and is available on the PERSA website. And through all of those, there wasn't a real strong signal. We found a signal in rain, so where it rained in one year, if we had heavy downpours in one, uh, in one year, the, the, the subsequent trajectory or the next year's cuttlefish population appeared to decline. So we had this inverse relationship with a, a lag of about a year. Not too sure whether that was through freshwater inflow, or whether it's changes in salinity, or whether it was changes in water temperature or turbidity. So there was a whole range of, of questions that this, this opened up to us as well. We also saw a positive relationship with prawn trawling activity and effort offshore uh, we, met, we, we uh, measured the number of cuttlefish in the prawn trawling shots, and we found that in periods of high abundance, then you'd get more 
more uh, cuttlefish in those prawn trawlers. So it meant that if they were there, they would catch them. If they weren't, they didn't. We also saw inverse relationships with crabs and calamari. Now, it may be the fact that, the fact that once the, the cuttlefish population declines, then the crabs, which are a key, key diet, a key prey item, would increase as a function of being predators to, to control them. And similarly with, cuttle, uh, with calamari, um, if the cuttlefish weren't there, then perhaps that gave the opportunity for uh, calamari to come in and use that area to, to lay their eggs. So in all, we did quite a lot of investigation and not a lot did stick out at that stage. We clearly saw that fishing uh, didn't have a negative impact or any sort of um, detectable impact. Um, diving visitors to the site didn't. Um, and like I said, all that information is in a report that you can freely access. Then we thought, okay, well, if there's a decline here, what is the evidence of that population um, enduring through history? We, we looked at some historical information. In 1982, there was a survey done in Point Lowly um, looking at uh, undertaking an environmental impact assessment in relation to the construction of the jetty. Now, this, um, this team were looking at uh, indicator species that they could measure in the uh, unlikely event of an oil spill. They went out. Uh, in, the, in the areas that we'd expect to see a large amount of cuttlefish, you know, where the, where the jetty is now. Um, and during winter, when we would expect to see high densities of cuttlefish around that time. And the report did not uh, identify large quantities of cuttlefish. And I think uh, from memory, um, uh, only, only a handful were actually documented. In 1984, there was another survey done in the same area around the same time, and they actually took some video footage and we were fortunate enough to get hold of that footage. And we did actually find that there were cuttlefish in those surveys. And, and we know them to be the right spots because of our understanding of that area, we've actually been able to identify some of the rocks in the footage to verify that they're in an area and time um, where we would expect large populations or large densities of cuttlefish. They were indeed there, but not in the densities that we would have observed back in the late 90s and early 2000s. And then in about 1986, there was another group that came over from Griffith. Um, they did some work, I think, in front of the Santos tanks area, and they identified um, that they saw cuttlefish in those areas, but not at the large densities that were recorded in those late 90s, early 2000s. So it seems like there has been some activity and some cuttlefish in that area uh, through time. However, we can't get a gauge on the relative densities. Although we've spoken to locals that have been there for many years that used to fish from the rocks um, and have told us that they did indeed catch large quantities of cuttlefish uh, around that Point Lowly, Fitzgerald Bay, Backy Point area. Okay, so the second hypothesis is, well, was that peak in the late 90s, early 2000s, a, a population explosion? So did we have low levels of cuttlefish through time and then we saw an event and it's now subsiding back to its natural levels? So concentrating more on the increase rather than the decrease. Now the interesting thing about cuttlefish and other cephalopods including uh, calamari and octopus is they live fast and die young. Uh, they typically have what's called a sub-annual lifespan and for giant Australian cuttlefish their maximum age is around about 12-18 months. So they grow from a, a, an embryo in an, in an egg. Uh, that egg uh, undertakes embryonic development for a number of months. Uh, the animal hatches out as a miniature version of an adult so there's no vulnerable planktonic phase. It grows relatively quickly. Um, feeds copious amounts of um, crustaceans, um, gets to a size of reproductive age, and then comes back to mate and spawn and the whole cycle continues. So the interesting thing here is that the population that we see in one year, the spawning population in one year, um, does not endure for two spawning years. So once they've spawned, uh, then they may spawn multiple times over a short spawning season, they tend to die. And in a couple of months um, after the peak spawning, that's when you start to see large amounts of dead cuttlefish wash up 
um, on the shore, particularly in northern Spencer Gulf. Um, there's there's large uh, wash-ups of dead cuttlefish as they've just expired from spawning. They've then successfully laid all those eggs, and those eggs then hatch and then contribute to the next population. And we've seen a booms and busts of um, cephalopods around the world. Uh, and there's a, a good example off the coast of California where the jumbo um, Humboldt squid, um, they tend to boom and bust on the result of uh, good environmental or favourable environmental conditions. And there's, uh, from this article, it says, what's behind the territorial expansion has yet to be determined, um, but through some observation, they believe a gradual warming of the ocean uh, pollution and overfishing of large predators could be contributing factors. So the key things I want to pull out there is the gradual warming of water and the overfishing of large predators. Because these guys live so fast, their growth trajectory is highly, highly governed by environmental temperature. The warmer the temperature, the faster they grow. Um, and of course, if there's no large predators um, through uh, removal of fishing, for example, in the case of the Humboldt squid, then it creates a situation for um, that species to proliferate. So what came out of that too is that uh, perhaps cephalopods in general could be um, the, the, the key uh, beneficiaries of, of global warming. Um, and we've seen that in multiple species around the world. But another interesting thing that was mentioned here was that the, uh, the Californian Humboldt squid uh, appeared to expand its territory or shift its, its territory. We thought maybe the same thing was happening with giant Australian cuttlefish. Now we know in northern Spencer Gulf, uh, the giant Australian cuttlefish is pretty much a, a separate species or a separate subspecies or subpopulation to the rest of the state. There's very little mixing of the southern Spencer Gulf cuttlefish and the northern Spencer Gulf cuttlefish, even though giant Australian cuttlefish do occur throughout the entire southern Australian range. But anyway, we know that the, the population that we are interested in is confined to that northern Spencer Gulf. We also know that the region up around here, around Wyala, um, is where we, see, uh, where we see large densities of cuttlefish. Okay. So what we thought we'd do is look at other areas in and around Spencer Gulf that had similar um, habitat, similar rocks, similar substrate to allow the female cuttlefish to lay their eggs. And we undertook an extensive survey um, in these four zones and we found nothing actually. Um, now granted we were looking at a time uh, around 2013 when the population was really low but we didn't see a shift in that population. And what that did tell us, however, is that population up in northern uh, Spencer, uh, around the Point Lowly, that Point Lowly um, spawning aggregation is incredibly important to um, the overall population of the northern Spencer Gulf cuttlefish. Then if we look at the third scenario where we have this fluctuation where you go in peaks and troughs and booms and busts in population abundance through time, and that's something that's consistently seen in the cephalopod literature. You see these big peaks and troughs um, in, in a, a range of um, uh, cuttlefish, squid and octopus species. Now, like I said before, it's really driven by um, a number of environmental processes one could be related to the amount of prey or predators that are available or in the area um, at, at that time. If there's not very many predators, then um, you know, uh, cuttlefish, for example, would, would um, increase um, and then vice versa. If the predators' levels of predation increases, then it tends to cap uh, the abundance of prey. And the other thing we've seen with um, cephalopods in general is that temperature is a real key driver in the rate um, of how these species grow and proliferate. Now, <clears throat> the, um, the trophic web of, um, of cuttlefish or where it fits in is, is, quite, is quite complex. We understand that, um, that seals and dolphins and snapper and other large fish, um, salmon, um, uh, kingfish, etc., 
uh, natural predators of cuttlefish. And we also know that cuttlefish prefer to eat uh, small crustaceans and small fish and even other cephalopods and each other. Um, so we can see very complex relationships there. So we may be seeing some changes in that population on the basis of shifts in predator and prey availability. So when we weighed up all that information, we seemed to, to take a weight of evidence approach that indicated that this third scenario, third hypothesis, was um, the most likely scenario where we're seeing these peaks and troughs in population abundance through time. But at this stage, we still had very little information to support. But if we look what's happened in subsequent years, so we can see where we've had well, no surveys back in the early, or well, the 80s and early 90s. We've seen our surveys in, in the late 90s. This one here was where we were impacted by fishing. These ones were after the, the immediate closure. We've seen that decline down to um, about 13 and a half thousand animals in 2013. And we've seen this rapid increase and now a, a population that's pretty much returned back to historically um, healthy levels. Now remember I said that the cuttlefish um, embryos take a long time to develop and the reason why um, cuttlefish aggregate around that point lowly area is because of the rocks. They need to attach these eggs to those rocks. Now it can take a couple of months um, for these embryos or to develop into hatchlings um, and what they tend to do is hatch, maintain, um, the, live within the rocks until they get uh, a certain age and size and they migrate or disperse out of the, um, out of the area into the gulf and once they achieve sexual maturity, they come back. But what we did is we've got some temperature loggers out there and we've just been looking at uh, trends in temperature during that embryonic de um, developmental phase. So we're looking over an, an 18 week um, period here. Uh, and we can see uh, that during that time, you can get periods of increasing temperature towards the end of their um, development and periods of decreasing temperature. Now, if we look at both of those, you can see that in the warm years, we've got 2013, 2014, 2015, and 2017. And in the cool years, 2009, 2010, 2011, and 2016. Now, if we overlay those temperature years or those cool years with the population, you can clearly see that, well, we've seen a decline in that cuttlefish abundance. And currently, it appears that the temperature or the incubation temperature for uh, these embryos is the, um, is the best indication that we've got so far for that declining population. And if we look at the warmer years, we can see, well, we're starting to see a population increase. Uh, now, it sort of makes sense because if um, the animals are accelerating through that embryonic phase, um, they will grow faster um, and accelerate through that period of being vulnerable to, to predation. So it suggests that the, they've got a, a, an increase, or the hypothesis is they've got an increased um, probability of survival. And if they survive that earlier phase, then there's a greater chance that they'll contribute to that subsequent spawning population. So we can see the cool years of uh, matching up with the decline and the warmer years are matching up with the increase. Now, if you look at 2016, that was a cool year and you can see that the subsequent population had declined. 2017 was, was relatively warm and well, the pup population had increased. So there is some signal there worth exploring in more detail in future, in future research. Now, the issue with trying to get a handle on um, population dynamics on cephalopods and undertaking the appropriate management for them has been very difficult. Uh, and there's numerous texts um, on cephalopod fisheries biology that says that the significance of the effect of stochastic variables on annual species is really extreme. So this means that the, the, the populations can bounce around um, quite largely on an annual basis. And it's the main reason why it has proven difficult to establish a reliable assessment and management procedures for cephalopods. Um, now this is a continual challenge for cephalopod fisheries biologists and fishery scientists throughout the world. So in summary of this presentation, 
Point Lowly is clearly uh, a very important spawning ground. It's an essential component of that population, um, and particularly that area that is permanently closed. In the analysis that we've done to date, um, through looking at all lines of evidence, both the, in the uh, uh, marine scale fish fishery, the prawn fishery, etc., we found no clear impact of commercial fishing on the protected spawning population. And of course, we've got a lack of historical information, although there's some information to suggest um, that the population has been there uh, in various levels of abundance through time. Clearly, as we've seen with the rapid rebound in that population since it's low in 2013, that the population is highly responsive and, and variable. And so far, incubation temperature with the, embryo, uh, the embryos appears to, to have the strongest influence. So knowing this information, <clears throat> it's really important that we continue to maintain those annual population surveys so we can track that population through time. And it's equally important that we monitor commercial and recreational catches both within the area and throughout the state um, to make sure that they're operating in parallel and not having um, uh, 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 or not providing any sustainability risks to what we consider an iconic population in South Australia. And clearly protecting those known spawning grounds um, along that Point Lowly stretch, uh, False Bay area, is the most appropriate approach to maximising the supply of eggs to buffer against that unpredictability of the environment. So hopefully the information that I've pulled together today um, has uh, provided you with a, a bit more knowledge um, about the species. And like I said before, there's a whole suite of uh, reports, science and literature um, that is uh, publicly available on the uh, PERSA website. Thanks very much for um, enduring the time and listening to me for about half an hour. Um, thank you.